Welcome to the Neighborhood Church YouTube channel. Each month we pick one of our very favorite sermons and we like to share it with you. Now you might ask, well, why do you only do one a month? Well, we've been really pushing our podcast lately and we want you to check out our SoundCloud. Each week you can check out a new sermon on our SoundCloud, but each month we want to share you a preview of what you can expect at the neighborhood. So maybe you don't live in Saskatoon and you just want to hang out with us online. That's awesome. But maybe you're new to Saskatoon and you're looking for a great church to be a part of. I think you found that church. Come check us out after you watch this video and I know you're going to have a great time. I know you're going to learn about Jesus and make some new friends. So with that said, check out this video and I know it's going to encourage you. And we're uh... We're in chapter 12, and so just a little bit of review here, Romans 1 to 11. We've studied a lot of theology. We've looked at Jesus and what he's done for us. We've looked at the reality that we're sinners. Christ has paid the price for our sin. And then Romans chapter 12 is this massive change in emphasis where Paul says, okay, so that's all true. And now this is what you need to do about it. This is how we live this out. And he talks in Romans 12 and verse 1 about presenting ourselves as living sacrifices to God. And then in verse 2, he talks about a big part of that being learn, learning how to think properly. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the, how does that happen? By the renewing of your mind. Hear me clearly this morning. None of us will ever live right until we learn how to think right. None of us will ever live right until we learn how to think right. Our thinking really, really matters. On uh, my dresser in our bedroom is this tiny little gift bag, red and white stripes. And this is a very special gift bag because from time to time, some of you bless us with just little thank you cards and and sometimes they have gift cards in them and we appreciate that I take the gift cards and I put them in the gift bag last Monday was Pastor Donna's birthday and so around noon we decided to go out for supper I being the big spender I am, wanted to use a gift card. Uh, went to the gift cards and I, I was going through all of them and saying, Donzie, where do you want to go for supper? And we looked at all the gift cards, but I hadn't really looked through it for quite a while. And in there, in the gift bag, was this Opus card. And I looked at it and I said, what in the world is Opus? And Donna said, I don't have a clue what an Opus card is. So I've got an Opus card and I don't know what it is or what to do with it. She says, I'll Google it. So this is in my little red and white small gift bag uh, that I put gift cards from the church people in to celebrate. She looks it up. There's Opus card in my church gift bag. Gift bag. It's for hair replacement. <laughs> so, so I'm I'm looking at this and and I'm thinking. I don't know if I like this. 
but then I'm trying to be positive and mature and somebody in the church cares and <laughs> somebody in the church is noticing I thought nobody was and <laughs> so I say well how do I how do I use this and she says well they've got a store here in the city but they don't publish their address. You have to phone and make an appointment. So I'm looking at this and I'm going to like, who did this? <laughs> <laughs> and then Donna can, because I, I, I mean, I got this Opus card. It's worse than that, friends. I've got two Opus cards. <laughs> So I, I am honestly getting a little depressed and discouraged here. I'm having trouble staying positive and thinking about Jesus and uh, thinking nice things about you people. <laughs> Donna does some more Google searching. And these two Opus cards are actually to get on the subway in Montreal. <laughs> But, but, until I knew that, I was having a little trouble walking in the joy of Jesus. <laughs> what we're thinking about what we're thinking about affects us deeply. You can't live right until you learn how to think right. And so Paul, after those 11 chapters of really good theology, says, okay, we've got to walk this out right. And he says, this is what it looks like. This is how we, what we have to do. And the starting point is in our thinking. We have to have a renewal of our mind. Why is that? Because sin has messed us up. Sin has messed us up terribly. Sin has messed our ability to think straight up. Romans chapter 1 and in verse number 28. Just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind. What happened as a result of sin? Our mind became depraved. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 5, constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth who suppose that godliness is, is a means of gain. So there's this depraved mind, people deprived of the truth out there that has wrecked our ability to see things straight. Interestingly, contrary to what some people would emphasize in the gospel, uh, you're part of thinking that is depraved and conformed to the world if you think your godliness is going to lead you to a great deal of gain. The Lord says. We very easily in our thinking get conformed to the world rather than, than transformed. And why is that? Because the voice in the world right now is so loud, depraved thinking has almost become normal to us. Depraved thinking has almost become normal to us. So in a, call, in a university in Western Canada, 2018, the university got shut down for a week because early in the week, one of the students in the educational faculty uh, put up her hand and said, I think before we go any further today, there's something I need to declare. She says, uh, I want you all to know that I have self-identified myself as an it. 
I have self-identified myself as an it. Professor shut down class, shut down. <laughs> uh, the class went to the professors and they shut down at least the College of Education in that university for an entire week to figure out what to do because one of the students had declared herself a it. She's not a her. She's not a him. She's a it. And then they decide that what they're going to do here is do some sensitivity training. So the next week across the university, they're doing sensitivity training to know how to treat the it. At some point, it is going to graduate with a degree that allows it to teach. It is going to apply for a job with some school board somewhere. Possibly she won't get hired because she's a it, but when she doesn't get hired, she will go take it to the court, it'll work its way through the system, and most likely at some point, if I know our system, uh, the decision will be made, it's against its human right, even though she says she's not a human, it's against its human rights to not be able to teach. So some school board somewhere will have to hire it to teach. And not likely to happen because this is not a Saskatoon story, but it will come, uh, get a job, and my six-year-old grandson will come to school. And after the first day of class, we'll come home and mommy will ask the six-year-old, is your teacher a boy teacher or a girl teacher? And he will look at her and he will say, I don't have a boy teacher, I don't have a girl teacher, my teacher is a it. And we bring this tremendous depravity and confusion into the lives of our little ones who now think they don't have to be a girl because God made them a girl or a boy because God made them. They can just decide to be a it. Germany, the last couple of years, a man in his 40s uh, self-identified himself as a six-year-old girl. He says, I'm not, a, I'm not a man in my 40s. I am a six-year-old girl. And because, this is how crazy our world has become, because he is self-identified as a six-year-old girl, he now has the right to go into the washrooms with all the six-year-old girls anywhere in Germany because he has self-identified as a six-year-old girl. Sin, sin has brought depravity to our thinking. And God challenges us, God challenges us to make sure we don't live there or stay there or think that way. But that we let the Holy Spirit renew our thinking and that our thinking not be conformed to this world but that it be transformed. So Romans chapter 12, we've been spending some time there and we've kind of begun the journey of what a transformed mind looks like. And the first thing we see in Romans chapter 12 uh, I don't think we're that far along yet, uh, is this devotion, is these characteristics of the transformed mind. The first one is we don't think more highly of ourselves than we, we ought to think. We've discovered that already. And then the second thing we've discovered is that the, the gifts and the 
abilities each other have come from God. The gifts and abilities you have come from God. And the gifts and the abilities of the people in this sanctuary that you are worshiping with today come from God. They come from God. And so we uh, have to be very careful in two areas here to not think we're some brilliant gift to the church of Jesus Christ ourselves. Because any gifts and any abilities you have have come from God. You didn't pick them. You didn't choose them. The gifts and abilities you have have come from God. But equally true, you need to understand that the gifts and the abilities that are in this congregation today are also gifts from God. And God has shaped everybody in this church with special abilities and special gifts. And just like our gifts come from God, their gifts come from God. And we need to be very careful in transformed thinking to be recognizing that every one of those gifts is special because it's come from God and give them great place of affection in our hearts and honor in our hearts. So we've learned that already in terms of, in terms of transformed thinking. And now we, we move on and uh, I want to read Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. Um, and it says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in honor. So in verse number nine, we pick up the beginning of 25 identifying behaviors of a mind that has been transformed, a mind that's no longer conformed. And so we've picked up these three things already that are characteristics of somebody who's got a transformed mind. They love without hypocrisy. They abhor evil things. They cling to what is good. And now we pick up another two identifying characteristics of the transformed mind. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love and give preference to one another in honor. So let me talk about that first phrase. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Paul is using family language here. Now, there was a time in the life of the church, probably about 30 years ago, where I would never call anybody in the church by their first name. This would never be Paul. This would be Brother Paul. That was the language of the church. Everybody was a brother. Everybody was a sister. It's the church I grew up in. The church I grew up in. Uh, you'd never be Esther. I'd say something like this when I saw you come through the door. How are you, Sister Zimmer? If I was really comfortable with you, I might call you Sister Esther. Somewhere along the line, we've decided that's nonsense. That's crazy. That level of formality. And so we're now Jacks and Georges and Anns and Ruths and Sarahs. Does it matter? I don't know. I do know that in the last 30 years, Churches split a lot easier. I wonder if there's a connection. Because no longer do we feel loyalty to family. We just get tired of somewhere. And we'll just give up on it. That's not how we live as Christians. 
we are devoted to one another in brotherly love. We matter to each other. We matter to each other. We matter deeply to each other. This is not just a group of acquaintances that we happen to come together to at the same event on 11 a.m. on Sunday morning. This is family. This is family. And family cares about each other. Family has a deep devotion to each other. So in in conformed thinking, we just think of the church as a place that has some programs that help us figure out how to live a little better and and this place where you can come to on Sunday morning and get a bit of a pep talk and, and it has some trendy music. But God's view of the church is never an event. It is never a program. God's view of the church is these group of people who are deeply connected relationally, deeply devoted to one another in family love. And if you think any other way about this, and forgive me, I don't want to offend any of you, but if you think any other way about this, you still have conformed thinking. And you need to let the Holy Spirit transform your thinking. Where you see this is it's family. The second or, or next thing that comes, and going back to Romans chapter 12 and verse, verse 10, is that not only are we devoted to one another in brotherly love, we give preference to one another in in honor. We give preference to one another in honor. Now, now, what does that mean? Give preference to one another in honor. Let me do a little bit of a word study here with you. I know you love word studies. Uh, I probably think you don't because my wife says you hate them, but we're going to do them anyhow. Honor is the Greek word time. Honor is the Greek word T may. Now you look at it and how do you want to say it? Yeah, but it's not time, it's T may. And T may means a valuing by which the price is fixed. So what what is honor? It's valuing something and putting a a price on it. So how is this used in scripture? 2 Corinthians, maybe it's 1 Corinthians, uh, chapter 7, verse 23 says, you were bought with a T-me. You were bought with a T-me. Same word as honor in Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Price, honor. Used exact same word. What honor, what value, what price did God put on your life and on your heart? He said, you are so valuable to me, I will have my son give up his life for you. That's the value God puts on you. It's a high value. High value. What do we do with one another? We put a high value on one another. 
That's how we're supposed to live. And I would suggest to you that if you really get this thing about being devoted to one another in brotherly love, that the next logical thing that comes out of that is you want to honor one another. You want to honor one another. You place value on one another. And friends, as soon as the church thinks, oh yeah, well I can say I love them, but I don't need to honor them. I don't need to value their gifts. I don't need to value their ministries. But I love them. As soon as you start talking like that, what you end up with is a deeply, end up with is a deeply dysfunctional family. Because in families that are functioning well, they love one another and they value each other greatly. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 7, verse 23. Listen to this uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12. I cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think are less honorable... We bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more, per, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Do you catch how the body works? We just... We just honor one another. That's <laughs> what we do. It's how the church works. We honor one another. And if we don't do that, the end of the third line from the bottom, we get division in the body. Oh, I don't need to honor them. We honor each other, period. <laughs> That's what transformed thinking does. Any other thinking is still conformed to the world. And yet, obviously, there's something in us that uh, wants attention, and we have to fight it. We do have a little bit of Phariseeism in it. Matthew chapter uh, 20, Matthew chapter 23. Jesus spoke to the crowds, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you to do, do and observe, but do not do according to the deeds. They say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on man's shoulders. They, they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. They do all their deeds to be noticed by man. They broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets chief seats in the synagogues father we don't live that way we don't live that way now now let's go back to one slide Romans chapter 12 and verse 10 and just catch what this really means give preference to one another in love but I want to read it out of English standard version outdo one another in showing honor New Revised Standard Version. Outdo one another in showing honor. Holman uh, Christian Standard Bible. Outdo one another in showing honor. <laughs> what's, if there's any competition, if there's any competition in the church, what's the competition? It's to outdo each other in making sure everyone else feels honored. That's what happens when our mind has been transformed. I've said this here before, but marriage has got a lot easier for me once I've discovered that I need to stop expecting Donna to make me feel like a king, and I need to start making sure that she feels like a queen. And I tell you, as soon as I figured that out, poof, things just got better and we started going in another direction. Why? Because we are meant to be as Christians, people who hand out honor. 
So Grimm's fairy tale, and I'll try to end with this. So the Grimm brothers in the early 1800s wrote a bunch of fairy tales. You can go to most public libraries and still pick up Grimm's fairy tales. I'm going to share you with you one of Grimm's fairy tales. Uh, there was a small old man who had a very shaky hand. And he drooled a lot. When he ate at the table, he'd hold the cutlery, but he couldn't hold it still, and it would clang and clatter all through the meal. Every once in a while, he'd manage to get some food on his fork or spoon, but the food would drop to the floor. It seldom ended up in his mouth. When it ended up in his mouth, he ate so loudly This old man lived with his son. This small old man lived with his son and daughter-in-law. And his daughter-in-law said to the son, your dad is taking away my happiness. We cannot let him eat with us any longer. And so the son went and the son made for his dad a wooden feeding trough, a feeding trough. And they put all of his food from then on in the wooden feeding trough and they put him in the corner of the kitchen where they couldn't see him eat. One day they came home from the end of the day and their four-year-old son was sitting in the corner of one of the rooms in the house and he had some pieces of wood and he was trying to put them together and, and the dad said, what are you doing, son? And he said, dad, I'm trying to build a trough for you and mommy like you built for grandpa so that when you're old, I'll have something you can eat out of. And that night, they burned Grandpa's feeding trough, and they brought him back to the supper table. Most of us don't give enough thought to the reality that there's a lot more reaping in life than we realize. The strength of our lives and the strength of our contribution to church and society at large, in some measure, is whether our mind and thinking has been transformed to the point where we really try to outdo everybody in showing honor. And so this week, in view of all the mercies of God, I think this is what changes things in our thinking. Back to Romans 12, verse 1. In view of all the mercies of God, if you get the mercies of God in your own life, and the fact that everything we have is just because God's been tremendously merciful with us, if you get the mercies of God, then we leave this place this week we leave this place this week determined to just hand out honor. We're going to honor our spouse. We're going to honor our kids. We're going to honor our workmates. We're going to honor our boss. Because we're just characterized by this spirit of outdoing one another in honor. That's what happens when our mind's been transformed. May God help us all. I hope you had a great time watching this video from the Neighborhood Church in Saskatoon. I'm going to put some information up on the screen in a moment that's going to help you get better connected to us, either by subscribing to this YouTube channel, connecting with us on Facebook, maybe you want to check out our website, maybe you want to give a gift. 
Any way you shake it, we've got information for you and we want you to be connected with us as a church. Giving to your local church should be easy. And with Tithely, now it's as easy as sending a text. To get started, text GIVE to your church's giving number. You'll receive a reply linking you to the setup page. Securely enter your information, and you're all set. Now you're ready to give anywhere at any time. Just enter the amount, and you'll receive a confirmation text and an email with your receipt. If you've made a mistake, no problem. Just text REFUND in the reply. Text GIVING with Tithely the simplest way to give to your local church.